the murder of an Atlanta socialite. It was unbelievable that someone would do something like that just for money. An ambitious millionaire. I do believe that the truth is finally got an opportunity to come out. Palm Beach, the pinnacle of American high society and one of the most glamorous cities in the world. How far would someone go to get on the right guest list, to be asked to the right places? You'll see tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Friday, January 16th, 1987, 8.15 a.m. A doorway on Slayton Drive in the Tony Atlanta neighborhood of Buckhead stood open. Inside, a woman lay dead, a box of flowers at her side. Her name was Lita Sullivan. The murder of Lita Sullivan would echo from Buckhead to the mansions of Palm Beach. That's where she had lived with her husband, a wealthy opportunist named Jim Sullivan. His ambition and their rocky marriage became the focus of the mystery surrounding her death. Lita and Jim Sullivan were wed in a small ceremony in December of 1976. They made a striking couple. For Jim, it was a milepost on a journey that had begun 29 years earlier on the mean streets of Boston's notorious South Side. Jim was born with little money, but with plenty of smarts, and most of all, charm, a quality he would put to good use. Jim Sullivan would charm the pants off anyone. He could be incredibly charming. He had this faux Brahmin accent, uh, and he would be very solicitous. Uh, he could be incredibly charming to people. He was also ambitious and ruthless. I think uh, he's one of these individuals that uh... Uh, has an unchecked ego and, and uh, uh, really didn't care uh, how his actions affected other people. He's rather a brash individual. I guess better words might be arrogant. Uh, he comes off as an arrogant individual. Jim Sullivan didn't plan to stick around South Boston forever. His chance to get out came in 1973 from a relative in Macon, Georgia. His uncle, Frank Beaner, who had a liquor distributorship in Macon, Georgia, um, invited him down to help him run the business. Frank had no children. Older man, Sullivan went down. Uncle Frank had really wanted somebody to take the business over eventually and to provide for him in his old age. Jim agreed to come down, but only on the condition that Uncle Frank signed the company over to him in the event of his death. But after just a year on the job, Relations between Jim and Uncle Frank grew tense. Jim Sullivan insisted that if the event Frank Beaner died, he was to get the whole business. His life would have it, or death would have it. Jim Sullivan uh, was going to be fired just before the, end, the anniversary of his first year. Frank Beaner conveniently died that week. The timing of his uncle's death could not have been better for Jim Sullivan. The scruffy kid from South Boston now owned a $5 million business. But Jim was still a little rough around the edges, and that's where Lita came in. Lita McClinton was raised in Atlanta's upper-class African-American society. It was a world of well-to-do families, of gala events and exclusive clubs. Carmen Burns was a childhood friend of Lita McClinton. There was a black organization for youth called the Jack and Jill Club. They were members of that. And a lot of black children from upper class families were at that time. And you went to certain functions, you went to cotillions, you became debutantes. Sort of the same parallel that was in, in a white society. In the Jack and Jill Club, Lita learned early on the importance of manners and style. She liked making up, she liked clothes, she liked looking pretty because I always told my girls it took time and it was going to take a little pain to be beautiful. Lita definitely liked the finer things in life and her family 
accustomed her to that. She had the outgoing personality of someone who never met a stranger. Jim Sullivan met Lita in 1976 at an upscale Atlanta boutique. He courted the 22-year-old post-debutante with all the charm and newfound money at his command. She thought that Jim was very charming, very thoughtful, a very affable person. I think he had that ability to be charming and to, you know, to spin Young's uh, lies from here to eternity. Lita had something Jim desperately needed, a sense of style. Jim had two pairs of polyester pants when I met him. He had a green pair and a red pair. With Lita's help, Jim's look was completely transformed. He restyled his hair, got contact lenses, and started wearing expensive suits. After a year of courtship, the couple married. She thought, uh, you know, that she actually had met a man that uh, was a little older and secure, and he offered her um, things that she, that she liked, you know, a little bit of glamour and a little bit of traveling. After the wedding, Lita moved to Macon with Jim. But Jim had already set his sights on Palm Beach. Jim always fancied himself as smarter than everybody else, somebody who belonged with the upper classes. He always felt that he was upper class. Um, he had fallen in love with Palm Beach. He had visited there a few times. By the end of 1982, he was shopping for homes there. He found exactly what he was looking for on Ocean Boulevard, a house called the Casa Eleda. It was just a few blocks down from Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago. Buying Casa Eleda was a stroke of genius for Jim Sullivan. It was also a symbol of Sullivan's nouveau riche aspirations. But what Sullivan didn't know is that in Palm Beach, nouveau is a dirty word. When he moved into the Casa Aleda, he thought he had arrived. They always call it a playground. I guess playground meaning the weather's fabulous here. There's beaches and there's palm trees and it's the rich and the famous. That's kind of what Palm Beach is. John Surovec owns and runs one of Palm Beach's most exclusive art galleries. I think it's better than the best of the best. And as you walk down the street, if you want to cross the street, cars just stop for you. It's the genteel spirit alive and well. I mean, it, it's, it's, I don't know, I consider myself very blessed to be a part of the avenue here. At restaurants like Dempsey's, the big crowds don't come on Saturday night. They come on Thursday. Thursday's a big night. That's the servant's night out, and the, uh, the residents don't feel like cooking their own meal, so they, they're here, on, a lot of people are here Thursday. Weekends in Palm Beach are reserved for parties at the club. No town in America parties like Palm Beach. And no town in America has as many private clubs. There's a lot of them. There are dining clubs in town. There's Club Colette. There's Palm Beach Country Club, which is similar to the Everglades Club in the north end of the island. We have people who are here because it is a very social place to be. There are black tie parties every night, many times two or three. Jim Sullivan's goal was to be a part of this very exclusive high society. He believed that restoring the sprawling 17,000 square foot Casa Eleda would buy him entree onto the Palm Beach A-list. It doesn't hurt if you're uh, an attractive, uh, young, energetic person to live in a uh, three or four million dollar mansion on the ocean. It certainly enhances your reputation and um, is one of the ingredients, I would say, that would, that would have helped him um, move in those circles. For the Palm Beach social aspirant, there are only two clubs that really matter, the Everglades and the Bath and Tennis. Despite his house and his millions, Jim wasn't being invited to join any of the exclusive clubs. They went to the polo parties and things like that, but he, he wasn't accepted. And I saw him in restaurants and see him at parties. That, that 
that's really the venue. That uh, I don't believe he was a member of any of the clubs in town. I didn't see him there. The problem was Lita. Jim finds out that being a white man married to a black woman did not work for the Palm Beach social scene. I remember Lita telling me that when she would answer the door, people would say, is the lady of the house home? They, they never considered her like the lady of the house, and she would have to say, well, I'm the lady of the house. But in Palm Beach, it was, it, it was quite rough on her. I once asked Jim Sullivan why he thought he could get away with bringing an Afro-American woman in the 1980s into high-class Palm Beach society. Sullivan said to me, hubris, I knew I could get away with anything. What Jim was too naive to understand is that you cannot be accepted by Palm Beach society overnight. Tycoons with far more money than Jim have failed. But the way he saw it, the problem was all Lita. Jim, because of his personality, because of who he is, decided at that point that his wife wasn't worth it. The social scene was more important. By the social season of 1984, Jim was being seen out on the town, alone. He was clearly accepting invitations to parties in neighboring mansions, $1,000 a plate fundraisers, and charity galas. He was accepting other kinds of invitations as well. She began to find long strands of blonde hair, and her hair was not blonde, in the sink or in the bed in different places. It wasn't just the affairs, though. Jim was also quite cruel to Lita in other ways. There were times, I think, that Jim Sullivan almost told people that Lita worked for him. He did start to exclude her, Lita from his life. Um, he felt that he wanted to become one of the important players in Palm Beach. He was unfaithful, and he had her on such an unbelievable tight budget that she would have to ask for money for, um, to get her hair done. It was, it, it was a life that she wasn't used to. And she really, she really worked very hard at trying to make that marriage work. Despite Jim's behavior, Lita wasn't willing to give up on the marriage. But before Jim would promise to mend his ways, he insisted Lita sign a post-nuptial agreement. Desperate to save her marriage, she signed it. I'm sure he felt that the marriage was gonna end. And he forced her to sign an agreement where she would only get $2,500 a month. She signed it. After signing the agreement, she took Jim to couples counseling, where Jim vowed to quit his philandering. He even sealed his promise with a $28,000 diamond ring. The diamond may have been forever, but Jim's promise didn't last the month. She was in her house, and she found a pair of underwear that didn't belong to her. And she decided that that was it. That was the last straw. And she packed up her bags and came back to Atlanta. Lita was finally ready to be rid of Jim Sullivan. In August of 1985, after she settled into a $400,000 Buckhead townhouse, Lita filed for divorce. Divorcing Jim Sullivan was one thing. Getting any of his assets was another. To save her marriage, Lita had signed a post-nuptial agreement. But in the divorce, she demanded half of the estate, including Casa Aleda. If Lita's suit was successful, Jim's days as a Palm Beach big shot were numbered. A quirk of Georgia divorce law gave Lita a fighting chance to get what she wanted. In Georgia, a divorce action is not tried before a judge. It's actually tried before a jury. So evidence of womanizing, evidence of uh, spousal abuse, evidence of cruelty, those kinds of things make a jury trial divorce action in Georgia something that's very volatile. She'd be much more uh, sympathetic in, uh, before a jury uh, socialite young black woman here in Atlanta uh, before a uh, probably a, a predominantly black jury I think she probably would have done very well Lita once an asset was now an obstacle and Jim knew how to get around obstacles if the agreement was upheld 
he would be scot-free. On the other hand, if it was not upheld, she would be entitled to half of his estate, which I estimated maybe $4 million. But three of it was the value of the house, and he owed $900,000 on that. His life was over. There'd be no more big parties in Palm Beach for Jim Sullivan. The only way that Sullivan could maintain all of his property and all of his money is that if she voluntarily gave it up and she was not planning to do that or if she was no longer around. On the morning of Friday, January 16th, 1987, Lita Sullivan was preparing to take the next step toward getting half of the couple's estate. That morning, she was due at the Atlanta courthouse for a judge's ruling on whether the postnuptial agreement she signed with Jim was binding or whether she would have the opportunity to take her case to a jury. But Lita never made the hearing. At 8.15 in the morning, the doorbell rang. When she answered it, a man handed her a flower box then raised a pistol and fired. The bullet plowed through the flower box and into Lita's skull. She was killed instantly. A neighbor heard the shot and telephoned the police, then alerted Lita's parents. It was a horrible, horrible time when you can't cry, you can hardly breathe. When Jim found out about Lita's murder, he had a very different reaction. He called his girlfriend at the time, and the two of them made plans to go to a very uh, fancy restaurant in Palm Beach that night. In Atlanta, police scoured his dead wife's Buckhead townhouse for clues. In the foyer, they found the box of pink roses and a 9 millimeter bullet that had missed its mark. Police decided to keep the murder weapon's caliber a secret. After documenting the crime scene, Atlanta police launched a massive investigation. They got a description of the suspect from a neighbor. I saw a man running from the coach's residence, and he almost ran into my car. I veered a little bit. The neighbor described the six-foot-tall, balding man well enough for the police to draw a composite. Another neighbor had seen three men race out of the neighborhood in a small white car. Police then checked area flower shops to see if anyone had purchased pink roses in the last day or so. The investigation revealed that two other individuals had gone to a flower shop just about uh, eight-tenths of a mile away and purchased the flowers that morning. Investigators also established that three men driving a small white Japanese import had checked into a nearby Howard Johnson's a few days before the murder, all of them under what turned out to be false names. Hotel phone records revealed that the men placed three calls to Jim Sullivan's mansion in Palm Beach. And then a local photographer came forward with another clue. At Jim Sullivan's request, George Pearl was scheduled to videotape the contents of Lita's townhouse as evidence in the divorce hearing. But the day before the murder, Sullivan's lawyers abruptly canceled the shoot. I called them to ask, well, why is it we aren't doing this production that he really needs for his case? Well, I don't know. He just doesn't want to do it. He's canceled it. The Atlanta police were confident that Jim Sullivan was somehow involved in Lita's murder. But down in Palm Beach, Jim had a different theory that he shared with anyone who asked. Jim made all sorts of accusations that he was not responsible, he wasn't guilty, there was no way, there was no reason for him to do that, he wasn't anywhere near. Um, he started to th try to slander Lita's background, that she might have been doing drugs and that maybe it was a drug hit. Carol Wright has been a reporter in Palm Beach since 1983. He implied that Lita was involved with drugs. There was never any evidence to establish that. But I think a lot of people bought that, you know, believed that, and believed that he was innocent, that he was not involved in it. Especially now, I remember, because it was Palm Beach, and Atlanta was another state, another town. On Monday, January 18th, investigators from Atlanta paid a visit to Palm Beach. They interviewed Jim Sullivan and subpoenaed his phone records. One call in particular got their attention. It was a collect call placed from a payphone at a rest area, a 40-minute drive from the Buckhead crime scene. 
a call placed 40 minutes after the crime. As they were leaving uh, Atlanta, uh, one of them got on the phone and called Sullivan, and uh, they had a prearranged signal, uh, we are alleging, and he delivered the signal, uh, the word, to let him know that the, uh, the killing had, in fact, taken place. But police still didn't have direct evidence tying Sullivan to the murder. Then, in February, the investigators got a break. In a phone tap of a call Jim Sullivan made to an old friend back in Macon, Jim said he knew Lita had been killed with a 9mm pistol. This is, this is what is called a 9mm automatic pistol. Uh -huh. Apparently it has 9 shells or cartridges, whatever you call them, bullets, uh -huh. instead of the normal 5 or 6. This is the sort of thing investigators live for. They kept the information about the murder weapon's caliber a secret for just this reason, that the killer would describe it and thereby give himself away. And of course, the person who described the caliber was none other than Jim Sullivan. But the new evidence by no means guaranteed that Sullivan would soon be facing justice. A man with his cunning and his money would not go down without a fight. They did not have the identities of any of the, the people who were involved in the shooting. Uh, they had some information uh, regarding telephone calls and, and some uh, identifications that had been made by some of the witnesses, uh, but it was not anything substantial. I mean, it, it simply was not uh, enough evidence. Without more direct proof, a positive ID on the shooters, or evidence that Jim paid for the murder, the DA felt the case wouldn't stand up in court and decided not to press charges. For now, the mystery of who killed Lita Sullivan would officially remain unsolved. When the DA didn't press any charges, it was unbelievable. I, I was pretty, I was pretty disgusted. I, I just thought, boy, money can just really get you a lot of things. Jim Sullivan continued his relentless social climb in Palm Beach. Just eight months after Lita's murder, Jim married again. He fell in love with the woman named Suki, Hayuka name was, and that was, put him over the edge. He was, she was exotic, she was Asian. She had been married, I think, three times before Sullivan. With Suki on his arm, Jim launched an all-out assault on the Palm Beach social scene. And this time, he was successful. Thanks to some well-placed campaign contributions, Jim got himself appointed to the head of the Palm Beach Historic Preservation Board. It gave him a lot of cachet. If you're on that committee, anyone who wants to do any major renovation or changes in their home has to get your approval. After many years of struggle, Jim Sullivan's dream had finally come true. He was in, and he enjoyed his elevated position in Palm Beach's rigid caste system to the fullest. He was a constant presence in Palm Beach's fanciest restaurants and on its most exclusive guest lists. He was very pretentious. Uh, self-important person that, you know, just went around town in his, Mercedes, in his Bentley trying to be a big shot. Ironically, it was something very small that would bring the big shot down. In 1990, he was pulled over for driving with an expired registration. The arrest would set off a chain of events that would eventually land Jim in court. Not just traffic court, federal court. All I had to do was sit in a check, I think it was $25 or $50, and nothing never would have unraveled. But instead, he went to court and had his wife, Suki, testify in traffic court that the cop had made a mistake, that she was actually the one driving the car. Sullivan's tactic backfired, and an angry Palm Beach judge threw the book at him. Sullivan was sentenced to a year of house arrest for perjury. But that was only the beginning. Federal agents took the opportunity to search the Casa Eleda. They found a number of firearms that weren't registered to Sullivan. 
here you are under house arrest, and now it becomes a felony just to have the weapon. He had four, including a sort of shotgun, which is a very serious weapon. Jim was sentenced to another 18 months of house arrest. The additional sentence was too much for his new wife, Suki. In November of 1990, she left Jim and filed for divorce. The proceedings became the juiciest scandal of the season. The divorce from Suki showed a cruel streak. It was a show business kind of divorce. It was all media attention divorce. He went to all this trouble to bring in all her clothes and all her belongings to show that she was an extravagant shopper. And then he always had that kind of arrogant half smile, like, you're not going to get me. You may try, but you're not going to get me. But Suki was no leader. Jim Sullivan seriously underestimated the value of his thrice-divorced wife's experience in divorce court. During the trial, Suki made an allegation that rocked the Palm Beach courtroom. She said that that night, after they got back from traffic court, he explained to her why he had her testify that she was driving the car, that he was afraid they would discover, first, that he was driving on a revoked Florida license because he'd gotten several speeding tickets, and that that would then lead to all the other things, and he confessed to her that he had hired the hitman. Suki's stunning divorce court testimony was exactly what federal prosecutors in Atlanta were waiting for. In January 1992, federal agents arrested Jim Sullivan in Palm Beach and extradited him to Atlanta. Jim may have been too cheap to pay a traffic ticket, but he spared no expense to keep himself out of federal prison. To that end, he hired a team of top attorneys, including Don Samuel. He was extradited from Florida up to uh, Atlanta, and he was lodged in the Atlanta Federal Prison. Uh, so I met him there. Those were obviously very strained meetings. Um, Mr. Sullivan going from a $3 million mansion to a holding cell at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary was uh, extremely anxious, um, but absolutely professed his innocence at all times. The federal charge against Jim was interstate commerce to facilitate a murder for hire. The difference between a the federal criminal trial and a state murder prosecution is that the federal government must prove some interstate nexus that, that makes this a federal crime. In this case, it was the phone calls. That was the actual crime. The crime was not the shooting. A guilty verdict in the federal case would mean life in prison and a $1.25 million fine. Jim Sullivan's trial began in June of 1992. If he was frightened by the possibility of a life sentence, he didn't show it. I do believe that the truth is finally got an opportunity to come out in the next two or three weeks. The prosecution's star witness was Jim's ex-wife, Suki. On the stand, she recounted her story of Jim's confession. Suki told Sullivan had turned the radio up loud, so if there was a tape recorder going, there'd be no record of it, and told her that he had had lead a murder. It was a shocking allegation. If the jury believed Suki's testimony, Jim Sullivan was looking at a very dramatic change of lifestyle. But there are two systems of justice in America, one for the very rich and one for everyone else. And Jim got his money's worth from his high-priced lawyers. They tore into Suki's testimony, revealing certain unsavory aspects of her past. Suki's had a somewhat sordid past, and so they, they try to exploit that. Um, you know, call her a gold digger, because that's why she was with him. It was our position at trial that Suki's testimony against Jim Sullivan was motivated by financial concerns, uh, that she thought that if Jim Sullivan were imprisoned, um, that she would be able to get more money from him in, in the, from their divorce proceedings. With Suki's credibility as a witness in doubt, government prosecutors put their faith in the phone records that tied Jim to the three mysterious men. But there was a problem. What the government could not do, and this was critical was they couldn't prove the content of the phone calls. And in the federal case, the question was not, did Jim Sullivan arrange for the killing of his wife? 
but were those phone calls connected to the killing. That's what made it a federal crime. Because the government couldn't prove the content of the calls, Jim's high-powered defense team petitioned Judge Marvin Shoup to dismiss the case. Jim Sullivan's fate hung in the balance. On Monday, November 23rd at 10 o'clock, the decision came, and it was a bombshell. Judge Shub dismissed the case. I was flabbergasted. I, I think all of us were like, where do we go from, I, I felt sorry for her parents. I felt sorry for her sister. I felt bad, and it made me hate, it, that's a terrible word, but it made me really wonder where justice was. I, I just. I just didn't understand it. There were gasps in the audience. I mean, I felt so sorry for the family, the, the uh, parents, because I think they really thought it was going to go to all the way. Well, I, you know, everybody did. Now, keep in mind, the judge himself said, I reluctantly have to dismiss. The key question, what were those phone calls about, the government could do nothing but speculate. And speculation is never enough to have a man in prison for life. Jim Sullivan claimed absolute vindication. I had nothing to do with Lita's death. Her death was a great tragedy. And I thank God and my attorneys that this ordeal is over. But Jim's ordeal was far from over. When he returned to Palm Beach, Jim quickly discovered that Palm Beach was less understanding than a federal judge. He was no longer welcome. He was uh, pretty much ostracized. Uh, people, whether they wanted to tell him to his face or not, didn't want him in the same circles that he once was. Jim's time in Palm Beach was over. He left as soon as the Atlanta case was over. He put the house on the market. He sold it pretty quickly and got out. His next residence was a far cry from the Casa Eleda, a suburban ranch home in the not terribly glamorous city of Boynton Beach. Everything that Jim had worked for and maybe killed for was slipping away. He'd lost his home and he'd lost his coveted position on the preservation board. All he had left was his money. And even that would soon be under assault. In 1994, the McClintons filed a civil suit against Jim Sullivan in Florida. The allegation was wrongful death. That was the next best option that we had to pursue a civil trial. If we couldn't get him one way, we would try and get him another. The motivation for Mr. and Mrs. McClinton to pursue this litigation was never about obtaining Jim Sullivan's assets. They wanted Jim Sullivan to be held accountable. But Jim was as difficult a target as ever. Prior to the trial, Jim had excellent attorneys. But just two days before the start of the trial, he fired them. He told the court he was broke and would represent himself. I think the strategy was Mr. Sullivan, if he was in trial against two lawyers, uh, the jury might feel sorry for him, might give him the benefit of the doubt. And uh, all he had to lose in a civil case was money. And simply because you're going through a divorce, simply because I was going through a divorce from Suki, from Lita, in no way cancels out the feelings that I had. A woman whom I married because and solely because I loved her. And she was divorcing me because we had grown apart and had some problems, but that didn't cancel out the feelings. For the McClintons, the most difficult part of the trial was their time on the witness stand. It was horrible to be questioned by the uh, killer of your daughter. I don't think anybody can imagine what that's like when you're there and you know what he's done. This time, the system didn't let them down, at least not at first. In February 1994, the Florida jury awarded $4 million in damages to the McClintons. It felt a relief. It was vindication. 
but their satisfaction was short-lived. Jim appealed the decision to a higher court, and it was overturned on a technicality. Under the criminal justice system, the state has a person's life to prosecute murder. There is no statute of limitations. Under the civil justice system, the person that is the victim or their family has a period of time of two years. And the key issue in the appeal was the statute of limitations. So, despite the evidence against him, the phone calls from Atlanta, his knowledge of the murder weapon, and the motive, Jim Sullivan remained a free man. Jim Sullivan seemed to have more lives than a cat, but justice wasn't done with him yet. In January 1998, the Sullivan case was featured on the national magazine show Extra. Henry McClinton is obvious as they talk exclusively to Extra about their daughter Lita's murder 11 years ago. Lita Shortly afterward, authorities received an astounding phone call. Someone in another state saw the story, uh, uh, remembered particularly the portion of the story that had to do with delivering a rose or a box of flowers to the door of uh, Miss Sullivan and um, made a call uh, to the police department uh, indicating that um, she was acquainted with someone who had told her a story very similar to this. That someone was a truck driver named Anthony Harwood. It took us four weeks to confirm this information and, and, and to put, put Sullivan and Harwood together. Uh, at that time, then we, we, we secured arrest warrants for, for Tony Harwood and uh, interviewed him. And his statement uh, that he gave us, he, you know, he implicated uh, Mr. Sullivan as, as the one that, that uh, hired him to, to have Lita murdered. Harwood told investigators that Sullivan had paid him and two other men $25,000 to murder Lita. It was the break the authorities needed. They now had a witness that could tie Jim Sullivan to Lita's murder. In May 1998, 11 years after Lita's death, the Atlanta District Attorney held a press conference. We are here today to announce the issuance of a warrant for the arrest of James V. Sullivan. It looked like the curtain was finally coming down on Jim Sullivan, but he had eluded justice before. Could he do it again? Sometimes there's just no substitute for having lots of money when it comes to outrunning the legal system. But it looked like Jim Sullivan's luck had run out before his money. Still, what the authorities did next left some observers dumbstruck. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation called Sullivan's lawyer and asked him to have, the, have his client surrender the next day. The lawyer said, no problem, I will do that. Well, it didn't happen, and it wasn't gonna happen. Jim Sullivan was in the wind, he disappeared. Embarrassed authorities scrambled to find Sullivan, believing that he most likely had fled the country. Sullivan had dodged the law and avoided jail since his wife's murder, and now he was free again, leaving Lita's family frustrated and angry. Jim Sullivan, you're the biggest coward I know, and you always were, and you always will be. If you are so innocent as you proclaim, then come back and let's do battle again, you and I. A $500,000 reward was posted for information leading to Sullivan's arrest, and investigators soon received reports of sightings as far away as Bangkok and as near as Palm Beach. In, in April of, uh, of 97, um, Jim Sullivan was observed entering the, the port of uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and we knew that he left from, from uh, Costa Rica and he went to Venezuela. From there, we don't have any idea where he went. It's been rumored, uh, since he does have an Irish passport, that he may have gone to Ireland. FBI agent Mark Giuliano was put in charge of the global manhunt for Jim Sullivan. We're working with the authorities in Costa Rica, working with the authorities in Venezuela, Thailand, Northern Ireland, 
um, to mention just a few. I really feel confident that we will eventually find Mr. Sullivan. The investigators hoped that Sullivan's lust for money and exotic women would eventually lead to his capture. I think he will finally uh, be caught somewhere in this country coming back in for something. He'll be arrogant enough that he can slip back in or cheap enough that he needs to come here for some financial reasons. It's an old adage, you can run, but you can't hide, and, and we firmly believe that. His case will remain open, and we will have agents assigned here and abroad looking for him until he's brought back to justice. On July 2nd, only two weeks after this program first aired, Jim Sullivan was arrested at a luxury resort in Thailand after somebody tipped off the FBI. After his arrest, he told reporters that he wants to come back to the U.S. to clear his name. Jim Sullivan had power and privilege. Now, 15 years after Lita's death, he may finally face justice. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. Atlanta socialite. It was unbelievable that someone would do something like that just for money. An ambitious millionaire. I do believe that the truth is finally got an opportunity to come out. Palm Beach, the pinnacle of American high society and one of the most glamorous cities in the world. How far would someone go to get on the right guest list, to be asked to the right places? You'll see tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Friday, January 16th, 1987, 8.15 a.m. A doorway on Slayton Drive in the Tony Atlanta neighborhood of Buckhead stood open. Inside, a woman lay dead, a box of flowers at her side. Her name was Lita Sullivan. The murder of Lita Sullivan would echo from Buckhead to the mansions of Palm Beach. That's where she had lived with her husband, a wealthy opportunist named Jim Sullivan. His ambition and their rocky marriage became the focus of the mystery surrounding her death. Lita and Jim Sullivan were wed in a small ceremony in December of 1976. They made a striking couple. For Jim, it was a milepost on a journey that had begun 29 years earlier on the mean streets of Boston's notorious South Side. Jim was born with little money, but with plenty of smarts, and most of all, charm, a quality he would put to good use. Jim Sullivan would charm the pants off anyone. He could be incredibly charming. He had this faux Brahmin accent, uh, and he would be very solicitous. Uh, he could be incredibly charming to people. He was also ambitious and ruthless. I think uh, he's one of these individuals that uh, uh, has an unchecked ego and, and uh, uh, really didn't care uh, how his actions affected other people. He's rather a brash individual. I guess better words might be arrogant. Uh, he comes off as an arrogant individual. 
Jim Sullivan didn't plan to stick around South Boston forever. His chance to get out came in 1973 from a relative in Macon, Georgia. His uncle, Frank Beaner, who had a liquor distributorship in Macon, Georgia, um, invited him down to help him run the business. Frank had no children. Older man, Sullivan went down. Uncle Frank had really wanted somebody to take the business over eventually and to provide for him in his old age. Jim agreed to come down, but only on the condition that Uncle Frank signed the company over to him in the event of his death. But after just a year on the job, relations between Jim and Uncle Frank grew tense. Jim Sullivan insisted that if the event Frank Beaner died, he was to get the whole business. His life would have it, or death would have it. Jim Sullivan uh, was going to be fired just before the, end, the anniversary of his first year. Frank Beaner conveniently died that week. The timing of his uncle's death could not have been better for Jim Sullivan. The scruffy kid from South Boston now owned a $5 million business. But Jim was still a little rough around the edges, and that's where Lita came in. Lita McClinton was raised in Atlanta's upper-class African-American society. It was a world of well-to-do families.